Welcome to the skies over Longmont. This is staff astronomer John Ainsworth of the Cherrywood Observatory for Longmont Public Media. This is August 2020. In the news this month, comets again. Comet Neowise put on a great show in July. There are many uh, amateur and professional photographs of this on the internet. This is a picture I took from Southern Colorado in Mueller State Park. This is the visitor center parking lot at about 4.30 in the morning. The comet itself is over here on the left. This is the planet Venus on the right. This is the star cluster the Pleiades in the constellation of Taurus in the upper right. This is taken by an iPhone, so it was that easy to get a shot. It is now moving away from the Earth and Sun. It's still in the western sky after sunset. Though I could see it for a few nights about a week ago, I have not been able to catch it with my eyes over the last week. Comet Lemon is much dimmer. It's down around eight and a half magnitude right now. We covered this as a, an approaching comet. It is now moving past the star Arcturus in the constellation of Bootes, heading this direction through the sky. That puts it high in the southwestern sky after sunset. You can take a look at an update from last month's chart where it was coming up out of the western horizon. It's now going off up off the top of the screen. Its best visibility will be August. This is a graph taking into account the position of the comet, its brightness, and interfering effects like the moon. So here's the moon at the beginning of September, making it much harder to see. So throughout August, this will be the time to release with binoculars, get out and try to find comet lemon. Also in the news, the announcement that astronomers can't quite pin down some very basic parameters describing the universe, and one is how smooth it is, which is related to how fast it's expanding and its age. This is a piece of the data taken by what's called the Kilo Degree Survey, or KIDS, Looking at the clumping of matter, both dark matter and visible matter in the form of galaxies and such. This project used a 268 megapixel, what they call Omega camera. I guess I would call a camera that big an Omega cam, absolutely. This is sitting on the 2.6 meter very large telescope, survey telescope at the Sierra Parnell in Chile. Took a look at 1,006 square degrees of the sky looking for the clumping of galaxies in dark matter. Here's the instrument and the telescope. Cosmic micro, microwave background, oh, that's twice, sorry. Uh, radiation uh, clumping was measured most accurately by the European Planck mission. This clumping, among other things, gives us an idea of how big the universe is, how old it is. Those are the same basically for our purposes here. But the kids, looking at the clumping of material after this cosmic microwave background radiation, doesn't agree with the clumping that we see in this glow left over by the Big Bang that's surrounding us at the very edge of observable space. So 8.3% smaller than expected means the universe is smoother instead of the universe being 13.8 billion years old, give or take, maybe as low as 12.6 billion years. We also have a disagreement in other data that we can collect to look at the expansion rate of the universe that kind of tilts towards this too. So this, is, this is interesting, but they still have more data to analyze and they'll be coming out with a re more refined set of measurements in the months to come. Other projects run by other countries will be coming out in the next few months to a year as well. Big star parties. Well, we're still having many things canceled because of the 
worldwide pandemic. So some of the ones that we've covered for August that may have been going on. Uh, Stella Fane, Almost Heaven, Summer Star Party, in West Virginia, the Maine Astro Retreat, Saskatchewan, Summer Party, Star Fest in Ontario, the Becca and Wood Buffalo Dark Sky Festival, Northwest Star Fest in Wisconsin are all canceled now. The Northern Nights Star Festival in Palisade, New Mexico is still on for August 18th to 24, and that's not too far away. Do contact them, see if there's still a way to get in on the fun if you have the time and are so inclined. Looking out in September and October, the Okie Tech Star Party is a great one to go to in Kenton, Oklahoma, right at the very end of the Oklahoma Panhandle, touching Colorado. It's actually pretty easy to jog from where this star party happens to the southern border of Colorado, but it's going to be canceled. Arcadia, Knight, Maine, Black Forest Star Party, and Pennsylvania Connecticut Star Party are all canceled. But looking into later September and into October, a bunch of things are still possibly going to happen. The Illinois Dark Skies, Bootleg Fall Star Party, Idaho Star Party, Alberta Star Party, Hidden Hollow in Ohio, Astronomy at the Beach in Michigan, Enchanted Skies Star Party, all possibly going on. Again, take a look at skyandtelescope.org. Under their astronomy news, they have a link for the 2020 star parties that is constantly being updated. Your Astro 101 lesson for August. Meteor showers. These are grains of sand from the sky. Most of them, if they're really big, they can be a much more significant rock that makes it down and hits the earth, but we're interested in what these meteors are. And these meteors are grains of sand, little specks of dust, moving very rapidly, many tens of miles per second. Yep, that's right, that's very fast. They hit our atmosphere, burn up due to friction. So if you put your hands together and rub real fast, you can feel the heat generated by this morning's bacon and eggs turning into heat in your hands. If you did fast enough, you'd get an incandescent flash of light, and it would hurt a lot. So these little grains of sand are burning up far above your head, down to 50 miles or so. Meteor showers are the same little specks of dust burning up in our atmosphere, but they're associated with the orbit of a present or past comet. And it's gone around and around in its orbit over vast amounts of time, dropping these little particles and leaving them in this big loop. The Earth goes through the old or present day elliptical orbit of this comet, and we get a regular meteor shower have to intersect that stream of particles though. And the reason that's this month's lesson is that the Perseid meteor shower is one of the more famous meteor showers out there. It is visible from late July into late August. There are some Perseids occurring, but the peak occurs on the night of August 12th and 13th. All you have to do is go out lay on the hood of your car or get on a lawn chair, look east late in the evening or in the morning, look at these little streaks of light coming away from a, it looks like a single point in the sky, if you can map them all back. They're all parallel to each other, just like railroad tracks, but if you look at railroad tracks, they seem to converge to a point in the distance as well. So it's the same radial phenomena. If you have a shortwave radio or an AM radio, you can tune to a dead part of the radio band where you hear nothing but static, and these do generate little bursts of radio energy. So you can hear little whistles and pops due to incoming meteors. I once went out to look at the meteor shower when I was staying in Florida for a summer doing lightning research, and it was too foggy and hazy at night for me to really see much of anything, but I did pick up some on the AM radio. Let's take a look at the sky above your backyard. If you go out to look at the moon in the beginning of the month, we are at full moon on the 4th. 
You won't see the moon in the evening sky for about a two weeks because it'll be a new moon on the 19th. Then you'll have the crescent moon becoming a first quarter moon in the evening sky at the end of the month. In the evening, Jupiter and Saturn are up almost all night, uh, just setting in the very early hours pre-dawn. Very bright in the southern sky. They're about seven three quarter degrees apart at the beginning of the month, and they are drifting just a little bit further apart, eight and a half degrees apart at the end of the month. On either side of midnight, Jupiter and Saturn will still be visible. In the morning, Mars rises about three hours after sunset and it's up for the rest of the night. Neptune rises two hours before Mars and Uranus about an hour and a half after Mars. Putting this all together in a nice picture, here at midnight, middle of the month, Jupiter and Saturn are over here the southern sky just west of the meridian, the line dividing the east and west half of the sky. Here's Mars way over here. There's Neptune right in the center of the screen and Uranus over here in the east. In the pre-dawn, Jupiter and Saturn, like I said, will set about 2 or 3 a.m. in the southwestern sky. In the southern sky, Mars and Neptune are up high. In the southeastern sky, you have Uranus. In the pre-dawn sky, Venus will be very bright. And at the beginning of the month, Mercury will be in the morning sky as well. Then it'll sink down, be too close to the sun to be visible for the rest of the month. Looking at August 1st at 5 a.m., here's Mars up here on the meridian on the line dividing the sky in half east and west going right into the southern horizon point on the right. There's Uranus. There's Venus down here. And right down here is Mercury with the glow of the sun beginning to encroach. Speaking of the sun, August 1st, sunrise as it is really at 6 a.m. Sunset at 8.12. A day is about 14 hours. 12 minutes long. At the end of the month, we have bumped the sunrise forward a half hour to 6.30. And we've gone 45 minutes in time to 7.31 for sunset. And down to just about 13 hours of daylight. So we've lost an hour and 10 minutes-ish. At noon, the sun has gone from 70 degrees, 68 degrees, up in the sky at local noon, down to 58, so 10 degrees. And if you go back to an earlier video, we talked about measuring distances in the sky. That's your fist with your thumb on the outside of your fingers at arm's length up and down. So that's 10 degrees. Your feature object. This month will be Saturn. Last month was Jupiter. That is a beautiful spacecraft take an image, everything's perfect. This would be more what you would see in binoculars going out in your backyard. That little dot right there is its largest moon, Titan, with a methane hydrological system. I guess you shouldn't call it hydrology because it's not water. A methane cycle. In a small telescope, you might see this break in the rings called Cassini's division, some of the banding on the cloud tops of Saturn, and a better view of the big moon Titan. Your observing challenge will be another planet. We're going to look for Uranus itself with the naked eye. It's magnitude 5.78. If you have good eyes in a dark location, no moon or anything or street lights to interfere, and you've been outside for a while, you can see theoretically down to about six, six and a half magnitude. The higher the number, the dimmer the object. Some people have been known to see as dimly a seventh magnitude. So it's theoretically within reach of the human eye. I think I've glimpsed it myself a few times, but that's why this is a challenge. This is best in the last two weeks of the month because that's when the moon won't be in this part of 
the sky. Looking at our eastern sky in the morning, here's Mars up here and Pleiades, the little star cluster that looks like a dipper but isn't. And just about halfway between them, a little bit towards the Pleiades, is where Uranus is. Give it a shot. Your astronomy events near Longmont. We're getting more online options, so there are things to do with the astronomy clubs and astronomy meetings around the Front Range on August 20th, 7 o'clock p.m. Dark Skies Matter by Deborah Price and Rebecca Dixon via Zoom, longmontastro.org. Boulder County Parks and Open Space Star Party at Rabbit Mountain is still canceled. It would have been August 22nd, 8.30 p.m. and on. Little Thompson Observatory is decided to remain closed to public events through the end of the year. Maybe around October, there could be some Zoom meetings coming on their normal meeting night. So stay tuned to starkids.org for that. The Estes Park Memorial Observatory is going to remain closed to the end of September. Angelsabove.org Northern Colorado Astronomical Society will have Carly Howlett time to return to Pluto August 6th at 7.15 p.m. via webcast. Go to nocoastro.org. Decided to add the Fisk Planetarium. I don't know how I missed them in the previous months. The University of Colorado Boulder. They do not have show times for now, but I wanted to create that slide and you can keep an eye on their possible opening up Colorado dot edu slash fisk i have no confirmation of this but maybe when theaters open they will be comfortable and opening as well if you look at the regal app they think they're gonna be opening up around august 21st so that's conjecture upon conjecture related to that the summers bosch observatory they have free open houses every Friday evening, 8 p.m., 9 p.m. during the CU summer sessions. I looked all over the site. It, I don't see them saying that they're closed or canceled. Maybe they just assume everyone knows and isn't going to try. But you can certainly go to coloradoedu SBO and see if you can go there and take a look through their telescopes. If not, contact someone there and find out when they're going to open. In the further reading section, I said last month that we would do apps this time. Far and above and beyond everything else, Sky Safari Pro, which can be pretty expensive, 20 to 40 bucks, and there are add-ons you can purchase additional databases and special tours and things inside, but none of those are critical to the operation of the thing. But for iPad and iPhone, it is just amazing. In fact, it is as pleasing to look at Sky Safari Pro as it is the night sky with fewer bugs if you're inside. Stellarium is free, and that's also available on other, all other platforms. I'm assuming Sky Safari Pro would be on the uh, Android platform as well. I'd be very surprised if it isn't. Observer Pro, I only know of again on our iOS world. It allows you to create lists of things you want to see, search for through lists of objects, and also pull in forecasting data. See how clear it will be, dark it will be, and how much twinkling of stars you might encounter if you go out in the next day or two. Scope Nights is another really good one, and that too has a separate source of weather data. So that's what we'll get into next month. We'll take a look at not only what those apps do, but also websites and other sources you can go to to predict whether it will be clear before you hop in your car and drive out into a dark sky location and pull out your telescope or binoculars. If you have any additions or corrections, contact John Ensworth at gmail.com. This has been the Skies of Our Longmont for August 2020. Keep looking up.